Good evening. Good evening. Can we all stand for the reading of God's Word? <clears throat> Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord this evening? Yeah. On the eve of what we celebrate as our Savior's birth. It's exciting. It's exciting. Um, so we're going to read out of Matthew chapter 2, um, verses 1. Oh, okay, sorry. Verses 1 through 2. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. That's exactly what we're doing tonight. We've come to worship him. Now I want to fast forward a little bit to Matthew chapter 5 when Jesus is having the Sermon on the Mount. Chapter 5 verse 14 says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Isn't it just like God to use a star to draw people to him, to the birth of his son? Just like that, we are the light of the world. God will use us to draw people to him. If we're doing our job as Christians, people are going to naturally be drawn to him just like the Magi were. And we see evidence of that every single Sunday where new people just walk in the doors, just walk in. Some people, doesn't, they don't know anybody here, but they're drawn. So let's remember exactly why God sent his son to be born, and that's why we celebrate, to be born to live a perfect life, to be the perfect sacrifice for our sin. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for the opportunity to come into your house and worship our Lord and Savior. God, it's our prayer that everything done tonight is pleasing to you and honors you, worships you, glorifies you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
thank you for uh, coming out to worship tonight. You know, I know it's cold. I know the weather's not good. Our first service was, I was actually surprised. Uh, we did an earlier one. That way, all the older folks would be able to get out. And, you know, apparently it worked because everybody here is definitely younger than me. Uh, <laughs> Oh, that was supposed to be a compliment. That was my Christmas gift to you, and that's all you're getting. So, uh, <laughs> Well, it's good to have you here tonight. You know, uh, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, it, it really is an awesome time of year, but it's, it's better the more you know him. And as we get to know him, because that's really what it was about, and as we get to know Christ, it's just like, I know there's been a lot of debate this year. Uh, I've even had some debate with all kinds of people, and about whether or not we should have church, and I get uh, nobody foresee, could foresee the weather, and that's different. But uh, it's a no-brainer to me. You know, no, it used to be. It used to be one of those, well, ah, I don't know about that because I got some things to do, but in my walk, as I get to know him more, it's like, it's not that your life revolves around church. Our life revolves around Christ, and because it does, everything that comes with it is what we want. So that's, that's just kind of how I see it. Now, Talking, uh, it's kind of weird doing a sermon and then doing another. We're live streaming this one, though, because we have a few that are sick and uh, stuck at home. But, you know, usually I don't stress about what we're talking about next week because going verse by verse, what's next? The biggest stress is where do we stop? Like, don't want to bite off more than we can chew. But Christmas is different because we know the story, and I can recite... Luke, the King James version of Luke, you know, just from Charlie Brown's Christmas, I always hear Linus in my head talking. And uh, you only have, if you take away the, the story of the three wise men, you, you have, I think it's like 38 verses, depends on your translation, about the birth of Christ. Whereas on Easter and every other time of the year, we preach Christ and Christ crucified, so you've got over 700, you've got all kinds of places you can go. But when you do Christmas year after year, it gets a little tricky, you know, and it, I've seen some of the sermons of uh, donkeys, like from the perspective of a donkey at the stable. I've seen them from shepherds, uh, you name it, you know, different. Let's talk about how the donkey must have felt when Jesus was in the manger. That's all fine and good, but I hate to speculate on things. I'd rather just know what the Scripture says. And so as I'm thinking about what are we going to talk about on Christmas Eve, I decided the Gospel of John. You know, that's not a Christmas story we see very much, and there is a Christmas story in the Gospel of John. And if you have your Bible, if you'd want to turn with me, if not, I have some slides. I, uh, I like the story, the Christmas story here, because it really condenses it. John's good at that. So a little non-traditional Christmas story tonight, but what is Christmas at its core was what I was thinking. You know, why, why do we gather around to worship the birth of a baby in a manger. Why, uh, when we hear these words like "Come, let us adore Him," or we talk about peace on earth and goodwill to men, what are we what are we supposed to be focusing on? And I know we say Jesus, but what is this whole thing about in the first place? So let's take it back to that. So, uh, if you're there in your Bible, before we even start, I want to pray quickly. Lord, we thank you tonight for just all you've done for us. Help us to get a different appreciation for what you've done, but not only what you've done, why you've done it. Lord, it gets so busy, and we've been so just isolated, especially over the last few years, that we miss out on so much that you'd have for us. And I pray that this year, this Christmas season, we'll not only remember your son, but see him in a different way, and see you, Father, in a different way. We just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Gospel of John, don't worry, I'm not going to take all night. I know this isn't Sunday, so, but this is just so good. I want to look at a couple of these things. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And I want to stop there for a minute because I don't know about you, but the story of creation, Genesis was a tough one for me as a believer as it is. When I first came to Christ, you know, those seemed like big stories that are teaching kids some good lessons, but I didn't understand so much how that was meant to apply to me. As I started to learn more, you start to see more, and you start to understand. But if you think about this, Christ was at creation. 
you know, we think about him healing people and walking on water and feeding multitudes. We think about that, and that's easy for us to visualize. But he was there at creation. We see it right here. I mean, he was with God. He was God. He was at the beginning with God. And before any of those Bible stories, the Son was present. Before creation, he was with the Father. He was with the Spirit. These three individuals, but together. And when the Holy Spirit moved over the waters, you know, we know the creation story, the sun was there, the sun was looking on, the sun was a part of that. And to think about this, this eternal deity that we know as our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was there. So we had the Father and the Son and the Spirit, and all three of them were present together with each other in all eternity, eternity past. Talking to the first group Earlier this afternoon, you know, it's easy for me to visualize never ending. Kinda. I mean, I don't haven't seen it yet, but but I can kind of get that into my head. But never beginning, that's a whole different concept. That's that's really difficult. But think about that. You have these three individuals before anything else existed together, and they didn't need anything. They didn't need a thing. They were totally secure as they sat. They were totally fulfilled. They lacked absolutely nothing. But here they are. They were complete. They were fulfilled. But even though it must have been a glorious existence, there's no sin, there's no death, there's no anything except pure holiness, love, unity. That's all there was. That's all that existed between the three. God's glory, it was seen And I'm sure it was appreciated because all three persons of the Godhead know fully the will of God, the mind of God. And I'm sure here they understand just how big God's attributes are, just how much he covers, just who he is exactly. And I'm sure they didn't miss that. So they weren't lacking anything, but but something was lacking. And it wasn't love. It certainly wasn't unity. And it wasn't fellowship. We weren't created because God needed someone. Remember, we're talking about a God who's in need of absolutely nothing. But it was decided that something new would be created, and it was going to be created for a specific reason, and we'll see that. All things came into being through him in verse 3. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So Genesis gives us the story, and we won't go there. It's pretty familiar to us, but the world was spoken into existence. It was just spoken into existence. So think about that, nothing. And now you have this world, and now you have light. You have the sun, you have the moon, you have all the stars. You have water and land separated. You have night and day cycles. And God, along with the Spirit, along with the sun present, is seeing this as he says, this is good. And... It was good because it, it showed something. Not that I mean, there was nobody really to see it except for the three that were already there that already knew all of this, but this is a display of God's power that had never been seen. Eternity, when you think about that, these three all alone, and now there's something. There's all kinds of somethings. And so these three uncreated, eternal persons, uh, they had their existence, sure, but this is new. It was probably in the mind of God before, I'm sure. It's not something he came up on the spur of the moment. Remember, he doesn't learn anything. He's not thinking up new things. He knows it all already. So when you think about that, it blows my mind. But here it is now, not just in the mind of God. It's there. And it physically exists. It's tangible. Tangible display of God's glory where there had never been one before. That's a big deal. That's kind of earth-shattering when I start to try to put myself back there and think about those things. But it didn't stop there. This newly created universe got filled up with all kinds of variety. It had light and color that, yes, were in the mind of God, sure, but here they are now physically, hot and cold. These are God is spirit. We feel these things. We touch these things. But to think of that, so you have now all these planets, different sizes, different substance forms them. Uh, just variety in all of these, just the expanse of the universe. But God decided earth was where he was going to set his affection and further display some of these eternal attributes that had never been physically manifested in this way. I mean, this is a, 
when I was thinking of this this week, I, like my mind wanted to melt. When you start going back in time and trying to put yourself there, I, it doesn't compute. But knowing what we know about God, you have to start putting these things together. And when you see this, it's like his imagination is on display in a way that had never been on display with the three alone. Here we have birds, and think of all the different kinds of birds, just the different plumage colors and the different songs and the different shapes and sizes just in them. And think of the fish. There's so many different marine animals and freshwater animals, from the tiniest little streams to the ocean as far down as you can go. And, and everything created exactly as it should be for the environment that it's in. This is all first. This is all new. From the mind of God, physical. It shows us an imagination that would have never been revealed that he's worthy of praise for. There was so much more of God, though, than just variety in his creation. I mean, his glory was seen, sure, in all these newly created forests and this newly created wind that was now blowing through these trees. That displays his power. Look at this. I mean, this whole world. Uh, sure, as the sun rose and fell every morning in this new thing that he'd created called day and night, and the beauty of that just as it changes and the, over top of the oceans or over top of the fields, just the beauty of that. But there was so much more of God that was yet to be revealed, and, and it just gets, it gets mind-boggling to me. But let me look at John. You ready, Gage? Gage is my little uh, AV guy today. He learned in the last, last service, and he did a great job. There he is. He has it before I do. In him was life. Think about this. The sun is here. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And that's where it really gets ramped up. Because God, yes, he's showing these things that have never been seen physically before, but he creates now man. And the sun was there. The sun was there breathing life into this dust that God formed. The sun, our Jesus that we think of, our Savior, he's there. And he gave this man that he created life. And not long after, he created a woman. He did the same thing for her. He breathed life into her. And now you have these two creatures that are unlike anything else of all of his creation. These two could acknowledge their creator. And when I start to think about the glory that is due him, how valuable he is and how much he should be, come let us adore him. Now we have two creatures that can willingly do this. And so he shows then in that another of his attributes that hadn't previously been displayed in that way. Not that it wasn't there. It's always been there. God's always had all of these. as These are a part of him. But he delegated, because he is authority, he delegated a small measure of that authority to this man. And the father and son... The Spirit, these three were already one in essence. They were one in will, what the Father desired, the Son desired, the Spirit desired. All three of them always in tune with each other doing this. And now he gives a little bit of delegated authority to this creation of his to do as he wants. Uh, that takes a lot of power to do, but he did. But now... He's done this, and, and he's given authority in a small way to man. And even though God himself walked and talked with this man every day, even though he entrusted this man with authority over everything he could see, these animals, the, the, the fruit of the ground, he gave them boundaries, he gave them law, and warned him not to cross those, but they did, they sinned. And, and the creation that was so good that God had created and said, this is good, it was now plunged into sin, and with sin came death, and we know that story. Uh, but this wasn't a surprise to our God. Have you ever thought about that? These are things I used to struggle with when I first came to the faith, especially when I was first exploring the faith. Why? Why? Why didn't God just make us this way? And I know the pat answer is, um, well, you know, it's really... Better to be loved by somebody who wants to love you. Remember, God doesn't need any of his creatures to love him. He doesn't need that. He doesn't, he doesn't have an ego that is inflated or deflated based on what his creatures do with what he said. 
So there is, okay, yeah. But, but it goes further than God wanted creatures that would love him according to their desire. It goes deeper than that. Uh, this sin that happened, it wasn't a surprise to him. Remember, uh, creation came to be in the first place so that God's glory could fully be displayed. And even though this new creation of his used their delegated authority to sin against their own creator, he showed an attribute that had never been seen before and would have never been able to be seen had it just been the Father, Son, and Spirit together in perfect oneness, perfect unity. He showed mercy. He didn't have to do that. He did. Because that is part of him that he wanted to be revealed. I'm going to show mercy on this creation. He didn't destroy them. He could have. He didn't destroy the ones who sinned. He showed mercy and he covered them. And yes, curse came with the sin, but so did a promise. And he promised them that the seed of the woman was one day going to bruise the head of the seed of the serpent. And that serpent was going to bite at its heels, but there was no way it was going to get defeated. Darkness had now entered the world, but God gave a promise that darkness would never be able to totally eradicate light. Light would always emerge, maybe in a small way, maybe in a big way, but darkness would never overtake that. He, he promised us. And so the seed of the woman, not the man, the woman, would crush the head of the serpent. So for the next 4,000 years now, we have from that little creative moment there, God choosing for himself a nation. And he chooses this nation and he blesses them and sometimes he has to discipline them and sometimes he seems far away, sometimes he seems very near. But for 4,000 years now, these mankind is doing what they do and most of what we do is spread the darkness because we're born, thanks to Adam, in this sin. But we look at John 5, or John, I keep saying John 5, it's chapter 1, verse 5. But the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, over generations, this light was going to keep shining in a world that had become more and more and more dark. Even his own people turning their back on him to chase after darkness instead of light. These people that he showed mercy to, these people that he's covered. And that darkness would spread, but no matter how dark it became, all around, darkness would never comprehend the light. And that word, I, I, there's so much more to that word than just comprehend. Yes, it means understand. Darkness can't understand. Without the Holy Spirit's enlightenment, we're dead in our sin and we'll stay that way forever unless he opens our eyes. Yeah, so we can't comprehend it. But it means more than that. It also means overtake. So built into that word is, is that fact that not only can darkness not understand this light, but it will never overtake light. And I need that because when I look in the world around me, it, it can get kind of disconcerting. But this is something he said. This is his will. And so he chooses this man to make a nation. That nation grows. His light's starting to be seen. And even as his nation turned on him, chased after darkness, his mercy was there. And also his justice and his grace were able to shine that would have never been able to shine forth like they had if it was just the three. And through the centuries, another attribute that would have never been seen got to be displayed. And when you think about some of these things, his holiness, yes, his holiness is there. Again, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, they know all of this, but now it gets to be seen. And you see light best when there is darkness against it, don't you? You see holiness, you see his judgment. It's not as if the Father or the Spirit didn't know again, but now you're seeing it, and because we see it, we're able to glorify him all the more. He's just, and darkness will be punished because he's just. He won't let it go unpunished. He has to because, he's that judge, because of that justice. And so he takes this nation then, and he leads them through the darkness into freedom, back into captivity, back into freedom. He's judging them over the course of these thousands of years, as well as he's blessing them. And in every single generation... The seed of the woman was a promise that rang in their prayers, asking God, when is this going to happen? When is this going to happen, God? You promised us. You promised us that light would never be overtaken by dark, and we're waiting on this promise, the seed of the woman. And so they wait, and they wait, waiting for darkness to not only be gone away with, but this a restoration back to this original fellowship that man had with God. And 
waiting for that and waiting for that and praying for that, that peace was going to reign one more time and that light would overtake darkness once and for all and totally eradicate it, that that'd be a hard prayer to keep praying. But God would lead them, God would keep them all the way, and he did this and over and over, but then he fell silent, and he fell silent for 400 years. God's own people now aren't hearing him, and for 400 years of silence, they're waiting on this promise. They're still praying for it. They're still seeking him, but God hadn't spoken to his people for all those years, and just when darkness seemed to be growing over the entire face of the earth and totally covering the light of this glorious creation, this fallen creation, We see verse 6, there came a man sent from God whose name was John, and he came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. And the world did not know him. Remember, this Jesus that was born in a manger is the same Jesus that was there when the Spirit hovered over the water. This is the same Jesus that was there to say, let us make man in our own image. This is the same one. And so God is seemingly hands off for 400 years until John shows up and the silence is broken. The seed of the woman is going now to crush the serpent's head, but it wasn't going to be coming from men. Because men had some delegated authority that God had given them, but they used it to sin. And over time, continually done the same. Fallen men doing the best they could would only be able to continue to fall. But God still hadn't exhausted all of his attributes. And again, we're looking at this picture of God that maybe maybe you've never considered before. I, I hope that we will start and start to think about just how big he is. As we do, we start to see our place a lot better. But he wasn't finished revealing more about himself. There was still more that God uh, could have never showed outside of his own mind had it not been for this created world that had fallen away from him. And that's what's so important to us. It's this idea of redemption. This is in the heart of God. Our God is a redeemer. He didn't become a redeemer just because he needed to. He's always been a redeemer. He's a redeeming God. And as he builds this, it needs redemption. So he sits above all, yeah. All things are his, yes. There are, everything's created for him. Everything's created by him and through him and upheld by his own word, absolutely. But the authority that was given to Adam sold the human race into bondage to sin. We sold ourselves into slavery, and we couldn't buy ourselves out. So, verse 11, he came to his own. He came. We couldn't go to him. Those days were long past. As soon as sin entered in the garden, those days were over. There used to be a day when Adam could walk and talk with his creator anytime, unhindered by sin, able to approach him. There was no problem with that at all. But because of sin, we couldn't even come near him. We couldn't even come close to his holiness anymore. We wouldn't know what to do if we saw it. We'd probably be like Isaiah, woe is me, I'm undone. Even in Christ, we would say, woe is me. I'm undone. But especially because of sin, we couldn't come near to his holiness. And the thing is, we weren't created to be thrown away. We weren't created to be disposable. When God said, let us make man in our own image, it wasn't to wipe us out. It was to, well, we'll see it as we go here, but it was to look and glorify him. We were created to behold him in all of his glory. And we were created to reflect his glory. And we were even created to share in his glory. It almost sounds wrong to say that, but we were. And so the only way for sinners to do any of those things is to be redeemed, to be bought back. So God came to us as the only way because sin separates, sin blinds. Ultimately, sin kills. That's what God said in the garden. And for a dead man to buy a dead man is impossible. Can't happen. Darkness can't redeem darkness. Sin can't cover sin. Because sin does those things, though, only sinlessness can buy back the sinner. Only sinlessness is free from the penalty of death. Only the one who's holy can approach the holy one, so that disqualified everybody, and it still does. So he came, the Son of God, who is God, 
who was with God, who was there when creation came to be, who spoke it into existence, became like us. And he came to us just like we do. He was born. He lived like we had to live. He grew, he learned, he hurt, he had troubles. But the rest of verse 11 says, and those who were his own did not receive him. And that includes all, not just his special nation that he chose, but yeah, it includes them. The ones praying for the seed of the woman to come and crush the serpent's head wouldn't receive him. And men today, we're in the darkness. We can't see. We don't want to see. We couldn't see if we wanted to anyway because we're dead. But he came to wake those up. Uh, but he, le- he lived like we do. He uh, left perfection. Perfection to, fo- to come into a fallen world. Uh, he left his power to be the most powerless among all of us, a baby. He left all the riches of heaven to become poor here on this earth, and he left a place where he was served and constantly served by angelic hosts to be a servant. Why? Why? To show us who he is. That's why. That's why. To show who he is in a way that could have never been seen in perfect eternity, only in the mind of God. You can't redeem what's already owned. You can't show mercy on those who don't need mercy. You would never judge someone who doesn't need judgment. And if you did, you wouldn't be able to be called just. So he came to us and he showed us all of those things and more in the God-man Jesus Christ, our Lord, born of a virgin, the seed of the woman. And by the moving of the Holy Spirit, just like the Holy Spirit moved at creation, this is a very similar type thing. The son who spoke all things into existence was going to be born as one of us and learn how to speak. And he was going to have to learn how to walk, the one that walked with Adam in the cool of the day. It's, this, is, this is just amazing. But the words he said wouldn't be like the words we said. They're so oftentimes laden with darkness. His words would always reflect the Father. They would always shine the Father And he was going to live a life that we couldn't because he was going to be unstained by sin, and that's exactly what he did. And so as he lives this life, the day would come when he would die on our behalf, the sinless lamb, the one that never would sin in eternities of eternities. But we had, and he took ours from us, yours and mine, and he gave his life a ransom for many, our God, our Redeemer. And he was going to restore us to what we were created for. And to all those who put their faith in him, he does. He was going to fellowship with his creation again. Just like he did in the very beginning. And he does it now. We were going to see him for all that he is, just like Adam could. All of his fullness. Become one with him, just like the Father, Son, and Spirit were one in eternity and still are one. But his own didn't want him. So in his love and compassion, he does what we can't. He, he doesn't wait for us to call on him because we can't, we won't. He comes to us, and that's what he did. He came to us. Verse 12, verse 13, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Darkness couldn't understand it. It still can't. It can't overtake it either, though. Not the light that we're talking about here. This light's so strong that it pierces through the darkest of hearts. And in his act of mercy, God's grace and his power is seen in another way. And that's his attribute of sovereignty. It's shown every single time that one of his own are redeemed out of slavery. He gave authority to this man. This man used it to sell himself into bondage. But God shows something that no one could have seen, and that's his sovereignty, his absolute sovereignty over all things in our salvation. And he shows that every single time darkness is turned to light inside someone's heart, every time the scales are ripped off of someone's eyes, every time someone is, has God's life breathed into them again, God's sovereignty is on display in a way that it never could have been had he not created what he has. 
Every time the dead and sin is made alive in Christ, creator of all things, who knew us all before the foundation of the world, rescues us from his own justice because that baby in a manger would one day hang on a cross for all of our sins. God's justice is clearly seen on the cross. As his wrath's poured out on his own son for someone else's sins, he becomes the just and justifier. Two things that would never be seen again had none of this ever came to be. God's justice is clearly seen as his wrath was poured out on Christ for somebody else's sins, but Jesus died for every single one of them. And praise God, he didn't stay dead. He was raised, and he lives today, interceding for us now and until the final day. God the Son, who was there at creation, left everything he ever known to become just like us, to be despised, to be forsaken, to die, so that we could know him, so that we could see just who the God of the universe is. And it will take all eternity still looking in to who he is, and we'll never exhaust who he is. But this is his will, to be seen, to be shown, and to be glorified because of it, and glorified in so many ways, not just by the creation, but, but by this creation, as we are raised to life, and then in turn, that light that Chad talked about, we carry that. We carry that. We show it to others. So that was all done in a way that, you know, when you think about Christmas, and I look at it that way, wondering why he had to do all this in the first place, uh, it's pretty amazing. But if you want to find the Christmas story here in John's Gospel, I'm closing it up here. You'll find it in verse 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. That Word that we saw in the beginning that was with God and was God became flesh. You know, sometimes it helps to look, look at things from a different perspective perspective. Uh, and this Christmas, I, I want to encourage you to just reflect on who he is, you know. Let's reflect on why he came. And let's remember that even though we have trouble understanding what he's doing, we have under, trouble understanding his plan, we look around us and we say, God, really? Is this? No, that's not his desire, but his desire is to be seen and to be glorified. And he is glorified when darkness that threatens to overtake the light is thwarted time and time again. And when dead and sinners are raised to life time and time again, and when scales fall from eyes time and time again, God is seen every single time. And I know we talk about Jesus is the reason for the season. It's very easy to compartmentalize the baby. As you think about that baby, remember that that baby is God in a way that maybe you hadn't thought of it before the one that was there at creation, the one whose entire plan consisted of everything that's happened up to this point, including you having life breathed into you. That's pretty amazing because the ways of God are so much different than ours. So let's remember that he came so that we can know him as he is. And through him, we can make his glory known to others. That's why he came. That's why he died, and that's why he lives. I want to sing a song. Uh, Acapella, no music. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Jen's reminding me and helping me. Uh, I'm scatterbrained because there's so much going on at Christmas. All right, let me take this off. All right. Uh, the microphone, though? All right. All right, could you stand with me? We're just going to sing um, Silent Night. All right, well, I'm not going to sing loud into this thing. I'm just going to hold it way down here, but I want to hear the voices. So we have some slides for you. Can we sing this? Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, Tender and mild, 
That's it. He was Lord at his birth, the creator in that manger. And he did that so that we could reflect his holiness and so we could know him. The whole point is to know him. And, and like we started out, we don't revolve around church. We revolve around him. It's about Christ. Everything's about Christ. I just got muted by my wife in the middle of a heartfelt Hands off, woman. <laughs> but you know, it, it does. It revolves around Christ. And you know, as we go through the season, we're all going to be seeing family. And some of your family may not be believers. They may be in darkness. You know, we can be light. And that Savior resides in you to be seen so that they can know God, so that they can be free, and so that they can awaken out of their death sleep. It's a beautiful thing that he would choose us to display his glory. He didn't need us, but he chose us. And the fact that he's done that, that God is uh, pretty awe-inspiring, pretty humbling, and should make us as believers just want to serve him wholeheartedly. And I know we do. So let's pray. Our Father, our God, we love you tonight. And we're remembering the birth of our Lord, your Son, Jesus Christ who didn't need to do everything he's done, but chose to do what he's done. The fact that you chose all of this, God, it means so much to us as those that were dead and been raised to life. We were a part of the things you've chosen. That's just so humbling. Lord, help us to carry this light out into a dark world. We look around us, God, and it seems like every day it's getting darker and darker. But the baby in that manger would grow up to be uh, a servant, a teacher, a healer, who said that the gates of hell itself wouldn't prevail against his own church, his brothers and sisters, his family. He made a promise there that we hold on to today. And no matter how dark it gets, we know that it will never overcome or overtake the dark. And dark will never, never be able to stop what God's plan is. Lord, help us take that to heart. Help us to live that way as light, but not just light, light that's unafraid, 
unafraid to show the glory of God, unafraid of the darkness around us, and unafraid to serve you as we should. Lord, we praise your name. We thank you for everything you've done. Bless us as we go home. Keep us safe in our travels. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh.